all the tools you need. Okay, so now uh, to start with the hands-on session, I'll, I'll just walk through the pieces I'm going to assume that you have set up in the previous sessions, the My Jetscape Docker. Uh, so we're just going to start that up again and then start a Jupyter Notebook. So let me just uh, share my screen here. Uh, and so what you have here is my, uh, my terminal. Um, just to ask while I'm getting started, is this, is this too small or can, can people see this? Okay, I've got one thumbs up, so that's good. Um, it's pretty small. Okay. Um, oops. Let me see if I can uh, increase the zoom on this. Is this is this better? Yeah, I that's think it's exactly the same. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, it's just the Docker start dash AI my Jetscape. Uh, so the, just the standard launch the uh, the Jetscape Docker. So you should have something like that. And uh, if you recall from previous sessions, what you want to do is type in uh, Jupyter Notebook dash dash IP 0 .0 0.0.0.0 and then with the no browser uh, option. Hit enter on that. That should launch a Jupyter Notebook. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this is broadly familiar from, from past sessions. Um, now, what you have again is this URL, 127.whatever. And what you want to do is you want to copy that URL, sort of copy link. Now let me uh, stop sharing the terminal, I'll start sharing a browser window. Um, let me just do that quickly. My, my desktop here, uh, open a browser window and paste that URL you copied from your, um, uh, from your terminal. So I'll, I'll just give everyone a few seconds to do that. Uh, if you've done it, please give a thumbs up. If you, uh, or a, a green check actually, give me the, the green. And uh, if you've not done it, please, uh, or you're having trouble, put a, a no X. So um, it, it should basically just look like this. Now asking you to go any further just while we're uh, while we're collecting people. Do these reactions disappear actually as a, as a question or do these tend to hang around for a little bit? Yeah, I think they're there until we clear it. Okay, okay. So I'll just give a little bit more time. I've got 10, 10 check marks so far. So I'm just waiting for any uh, check marks or again, if you're having trouble, um, please react with an X and we can maybe get some help to you. Okay, I'm just going to uh, start moving on. Please open the summer school uh, directory in the Jupyter notebook and then navigate to sort of the July 27 Bayes overview. Um, let me just clear the feedback. Um, and then there's some .npy files, a readme for if you're curious, uh, that's one with all the, uh, the instructions in it. But there's also just a single notebook called Bayesian Inference Pendulum.ipynb. Um, and so please, please open up that. 
When you've done that, please give me another check just to make sure that we're all looking at this notebook. Uh, so I make sure that we're all together at the start. Okay, it looks like we're having, having broad success. Um, if anybody has any difficulty, please uh, sort of let us know uh, in the Slack channel and um, we, we can help you out with that. So at the top, I'm just going to, uh, to blitz through this. Uh, I include some suggested further reading and some additional resources for anybody who's interested and wants to learn more about um, sort of Bayesian inference, Bayesian techniques, mm -hmm. um, and sort of maybe a, a little bit more formally or more um, Sorry, Matt, more in depth. Can you um, zoom in a little bit? I think it's hard to see. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, I'll just try to do it with the browser zoom, huh? Is this better? That's better. OK. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, right. So there's a variety of little case studies. Uh, I link to all these different things. There's the, a great Bayesian data analysis textbook. The author uh, is at the forefront of a lot of these tools. Um, and he's made his Bayesian data analysis textbook uh, available for free in PDF form. Um, and he keeps it updated with various errata. So I just wanted to really plug that. And there's his uh, Bayesian workflow paper as well, if you want to sort of dig much, much more in depth on Bayesian workflow than I was able to. Um, I'd also just like to highlight some relevant Jetscape papers that are uh, recently come out on sort of uh, using Bayesian tools to uh, quantify uncertainty and extract uh, knowledge from systematic model to data comparison. Um, and then just finally a little plug for myself. Uh, this work is broadly adapted from a recent paper of mine. It's out on the archive and here's a link to it. Um, if you want to read it. Uh, there's probably a second version coming out soon. Um, so with that, I'm just going to basically go uh, section by section through this. Uh, now, I've constructed this um, with the very particular intent that it works out of the box. And what I'm going to ask you to do in this hands-on session is to modify things after we've gone through it all. And so the exercises are to be done sort of after we've gone through and you have an uh, understanding of how all these pieces fit together. Uh, so I'm not asking you to write new code uh, to fit into a pre-formulated uh, pre framework. Um, just to start with this first code block, um, just block one, what I basically let you do is turn on or off uh, using the provided data points in a CSV file in this directory. And I let you turn on and off uh, actually running the MCMC. Uh, running the MCMC can take uh, a decent amount of time depending on the number of steps and a variety of other things, uh, such as your, your own local system. And so what I am letting you do is I've pre-generated some chains and so we'll all produce the same output and we'll all know what to expect. And then what you can do when you modify something is then return to block one and say, uh, replace run MCMC here with true, and then you can run your MCMC uh, later and sort of see what happens when you've modified things. So this is uh, just sort of some toggles at the top. Uh, now I'll ask you in block two to import your packages and sort of uh, go ahead and do that. That might take a second, um, but those packages should all be in place with the installation of the MyJetscape Docker container. Uh, I remember there's been some package installation difficulties last time. So um, if you have any errors from this step, uh, just please let someone know in the Slack chat immediately and we'll be able to help out. So I include a lot of text here um, because I hope that both uh, this hands-on session and the slides will um, be a useful reference uh, to you. 
but I'm not going to, to read through this. Um, basically what I'm doing here is I'm deriving the period of a pendulum, which you might recall from an introductory course. You know, the period is two pi root L over G in a small angle approximation. It's a little bit more complex uh, of a derivation if you don't take the small angle approximation, but you can do it via you know, energy conservation and you can then sort of formulate this into an expression for the period. Uh, it's a bit of an improper integral, so you can sort of put a simple substitution in. And then this is the formula that we're going to be calculating as our, as our underlying model. Um, so what this is, is a the period of a pendulum when you've not assumed small angle displacement. Uh, but you have at least assumed that there's uh, no drag, no deformation of the string, no friction at the connecting point. Uh, so that's, that's currently beyond, beyond the scope of this. Um, I mentioned a little bit of details about how um, we model the data gathering process, but that's really just uh, fairly standard lab guidance that, that's given. Uh, I don't know if many have been TA introductory courses, or if you remember from yours, the, um, the error, a simple estimate of the uncertainty is half of the smallest tick of your measuring device. Um, and with a normal distribution, that's assuming that, that you only have a 68% confidence that your, your true measurement is within half a tick. Um, especially with digital tools, that's probably an overestimate of the uncertainty, but uh, I'll allow you basically to uh, play with that uh, on your own if you'd like. Uh, so all, all of this is set up to be modified. So now, uh, if you're following along, what we have here is the exact model. Um, I do assume a little bit of familiarity with Python, uh, but because of the way I've set it up, if you're not very familiar with it, this will just work out of the box. So what this does is given a value of the gravitational acceleration G and uh, theta zero, your initial angular displacement of the pendulum, it'll return a central value as well as an uncertainty. Um, and so this is sort of how that calculation is done explicitly. That's what's happening to function T exact. What's happening the model exact is uh, it's running just that T exact calculation, but it's allowing you to sort of add a parametric additional timing error. Uh, this is really only useful um, for generating fake data for our fake data comparison. Uh, when we're modeling that data gathering process as well. So go ahead and evaluate that cell as well. Should all evaluate. With, uh, with no messages. Um, okay, um, now what we're going to do is we're going to generate some uh, model outputs using that prediction. So I'll, I'll actually go ahead and, uh, and edit this a little bit. So there'll be a, do a git pull after the session. I'll make sure everything is, uh, all, all the text is, is up to scratch as well. So before you want to assign priors, uh, you just want to get some idea of how this model behaves. Um, in this model, it's a relatively simple step, um, but I'm, we're using a simple example to uh, model best practices, if you will. So please just go ahead and uh, evaluate block four. What block four does is it gives you sort of the G on earth, uh, a set of displace, angular displacements, uh, just taking a hundred of them, and then it, it calculates exact periods uh, and their uncertainty given that. Uh, block five just goes ahead and plots that. And so um, I'm also saving a little figure here. And what you can do is you can see for a pendulum of length one meter, this is how the exact period behaves uh, given gravitational acceleration on Earth, which we at least uh, know beforehand. So I'm going to get through the, uh, the little bits of setup. And then before we move on, um, to step two. So this is all part of step one, choose an initial model. And before we move on to step two, I, I'll pause um, and check if there's any questions. Um, so please uh, stay tuned. Okay, actually, Isabel. Hi, sorry, um, I wonder if I missed it. Um, what is the band on this figure? So the band on the figure is the uncertainty that I'm propagating through from, say, the uncertainty of the uh, length of the pendulum. Oh, okay, so that's somewhere higher up in the oh. Yeah, yeah, that's included in the calculation of the exact period. Um, okay, yeah, that, thank you. 
Yeah, sure. Again, because we're really interested in uh, quantifying our uncertainty, it's important to propagate those, those through. Uh, yeah, and I'm propagating those with the assumption that they're normally distributed and uh, independent of, of each other as well. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the question, though. So I'm just going to motivate some of our uncertainties that we get. Uh, Sort of in a lab I was TAing recently, uh, some students were using smartphone accelerometers. Uh, they're putting just a smartphone as the bob of their pendulum, and they were actually able to get very precise measurements. Uh, and a typical thing that we suggest in labs, uh, at least when I'm teaching them, is that you measure sort of fixed number of periods and then uh, measure the sort of 10 periods and then divide by 10 to reduce the relative error of your measurement. Uh, and so I'm just uh, sort of going through those details here. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to generate some pseudo data. Again, recall at the top, uh, we have this flag generate data true or false. Um, and so you can see exactly how that data was generated. Basically, all I'm doing in the simple generated data is uh, adding some, some white noise by sampling from a Gaussian with a mean of zero and a uh, and a variant uh, standard deviation of 0 0.002. So uh, just to uh, show you how that's generated. Instead, what we're going to do now is we're just going to um, take data.csv that's in this uh, directory. We're just going to load it in and uh, put it in a convenient format. Uh, so that's what this cell does. Um, which then brings us to block seven. And block seven, if you just evaluate it, will produce a plot of the data. Um, OK, so I hope everybody is with me still uh, and that everybody is able to produce this plot. Uh, as you can see, there have been no modifications to the notebook yet, so this should all be running uh, as expected in your, in your Docker container. OK, just going to give a second. Um, just going to put some exercises in here. Um, so actually, if we can just do a quick yes, no polling. Uh, let, let me see if I, uh, well, I'll ask questions one and two with just some uh, yes, no uh, uh, Zoom polls. So let's see. Um, if you, so question one is, if you include more data points, will you necessarily get better constraints? Uh, okay, got a yes, no in the Zoom. So check or X. I'm seeing some debate come up. Okay, very good. So we're getting uh, just a few responses. Figure, yeah, and the key basically here is uh, constraint um, and what better means. Um, and so if you include more data points, you might have a wider distribution, for example. Uh, is, but at the same time, it more, might more accurately reflect the underlying parameters. And so uh, there is a tension, for example, between these two because we know we have some statistical error going on. Um, and the other thing I'll ask quickly is, uh, I'm just gonna clear these, this feedback, is uh, question two. We're, we're making this, we're modeling this data, so we're generating it. Uh, just with a simple assumption. Uh, do you expect better data than this uh, in the lab or do you expect worse data than this in the lab? So, um, so just please give me another yes, no. Uh, yes for better data uh, from lab measurements or no from worse data in lab measurements. I think everybody is, is starting to recognize my, uh, my potentially trick questions. Um, it really ask, means, again, what does better data mean? So you're probably going to get more variance. So for those of you who are answering yes, you're going to probably get more spread or you're going to have effects that are not already included by the model if you take lab measurements. Um, at the same time, um, 
you're going to get actual data. And so that will give you a more accurate understanding of sort of the physical system that you're interested in, which is a gravitational acceleration on the earth. So if you're actually trying to measure that, uh, obviously it's going to be better to uh, use real data. Uh, now, I'm not gonna go through three, um, but basically what you can do in each of these is if you're curious, go back um, and you see here how I generated um, sort of model displacements at a fixed number of angles. Uh, on your own time, you can go ahead and add more of these. Uh, you can add more uh, of these fake data measurements to sort of get a sense of how this acts. Uh, if you really want, uh, you can go ahead and just build a simple pendulum and then update some of the values and, uh, and see how you do. Um, but this is all set up to be easily, um, easily modifiable. Um, and so what you can also do is then go ahead, return to the top and uh, vary your number of measurements um, and rerun the inference with uh, run MCMC uh, true and, and see what happens. And so really this is designed to let you, you play around and get a sense of this yourself. Um, yeah. So moving on, um, the question that arises is how much can you constrain G? Um, and now I sort of restate some of these details just to have them close by and say, okay, um, we have these models. In theory, you could construct a small angle model and perform Bayesian model selection. Uh, that's what I do in my paper if you're interested in reading it. Um, but it's probably a little bit too much material to cover in an introductory session, so uh, I'm not going to. Uh, if you're curious and just would like the code, let me know. Um, but uh, there's also the paper. So if you, if you want to skip ahead to the conclusions you can draw. Right, so now what you've seen is uh, we've done step one. So choosing an uh, initial model is all right. This is sort of step 1.2, I suppose, is defining the principal priors. Uh, now, this is uh, exactly how I'm, ge I'm generating that prior that I flashed quickly in the introductory session. So basically what I'm doing is I say, okay, wait, there's one parameter, gravitational acceleration G. And let's say, okay, well, I know that the gravitational acceleration on the surface of a massive body scales with the mass of the body. Uh, we have detailed surveys of gravitational acceleration on the moon, got detailed surveys of surface gravity on Jupiter. Uh, gravity on Earth is probably between the moon and Jupiter, uh, which is, I think, you could probably motivate a better priority. In fact, I encourage you to do so. Um, so let's say we're not 100% sure of that. We're only 99% sure. Let's just say maybe the Earth is super dense. Um, and so I propose that we use an inverse gamma distribution as a weakly informative prior, just to encode that information. Um, now, the reason I use this distribution in particular is that um, the inverse gamma distribution is defined, uh, sort of has support on zero to infinity and uh, not actually at zero. And that actually fits with our model understanding that at G equals zero, um, the period is undefined. So that's a, another reason to use it. If I were to use a, an infinitesimally small value with a distribution of support there, then sort of I'm, I might be cutting off a very, very small amount of the space, but in, by choosing a distribution with support from zero to infinity, but not at zero identically, um, I'm including my whole, whole parameter range. So now what I want to do is show you how to actually tune a distribution um, to reflect that. So what, you, what I'm doing is I am using a minimization procedure to uh, tune these parameters. So what I do is I define a tuning function uh, embedded in here and use root finding. And we can then do just sort of shift enter to evaluate that. It's already done. And we can go through and plot. And this is the exact same plot you already saw in, um, the, in the slides. Right, so what you can see is that uh, for the probability density function, PDF for short, uh, most of the probability is going to be between say about well, 99% is going to be about, between about 15 and about one. Um, you have most of it down here at below five, actually, that's where the peak is. But you can see um, 
with the cumulative density function, so that's how much is explained by values lower than, than this, that you have about 50% of the probability is located below five and about 50% of the probability is above five meters per second squared. So um, that is our, our tuning so far. Now, uh, what I'm going to suggest is uh, as an exercise, you can go ahead and modify this however you like. Um, you'd have to rerun the inference, so I don't suggest modifying it yet um, because it won't reflect sort of the, the pre-generated chains. But what you can do is say, no, I don't like Matt's prior. Um, I'm going to choose a different prior that I think is better motivated. And you can then run through all of your inference and then say, OK, did it make a difference? Uh, and you can say sort of, but it, why is your choice better? So I'm leaving that for you. Uh, for the sake of it, I'm just going to, um, for the sake of some plotting, actually, basically, uh, we're going to define a distribution for angular displacement. Um, I'm putting basically no preference. Uh, this is an example of a uniform distribution. Uh, this doesn't get used in the Bayesian inference. I'm just using this to make some plots. Um, but just saying, OK, we'll sample between 0 and you know pi over 2 radians um, just to uh, swing the pendulum around and just get an idea of how it behaves. So we're just looking for plots of distributions. There's nothing, nothing here is used in the Bayesian inference. Yeah. So uh, just some exercises. Again, I suggest this for maybe a little bit uh, later. So once you've gone through and you see how it all fits together, then go back and make some changes. And uh, we can step through this uh, at the end. Uh, I include a link to the SciPy at stats reference. You have a link for where all these distributions are located. And there's usage examples there. And um, you can uh, do that. Uh, but let me just actually, because we have some exercises here, um, let me just put something in Slack. And if you take a, a few moments, please. Um, and in reply to that message I've just sent, please just propose an alternative prior with just a brief motivation. Um, you saw mine was uh, G is probably between that of the moon and Jupiter. Uh, and it's positive definite, smoothly varying, not defined at zero. Uh, so if you have any uh, any alternative prior that you can motivate, um, so I, I encourage you to put a reply in there. Um, I'll give you a few minutes, a uh, few seconds, or maybe a minute or two to do that. I quite like that. That could reply of uh, lower limit on G due to human bone development. Uh, you can really use anything to help motivate your prior uh, that is just not the data you're comparing to. Um, so pretend we haven't seen data and uh, to establish a reasonable prior. Um, I'll just propose a quick yes, no again, maybe in the Zoom with the checks. Uh, is a normal or a Gaussian distribution appropriate for uh, the gravitational acceleration. So you maybe just hit uh, the green check or the red cross. Uh, do you think a, uh, a Gaussian distribution is appropriate to choose? So give me some quick feedback on that.
Interesting, an even split so far. Okay, so not, not going to even split anymore. Okay, so I see a majority of you have chosen yes. Uh, I would argue that because the Gaussian distribution is defined sort of from negative infinity to infinity and uh, negative gravitational acceleration only exists if you define it that way with your, uh, with your axes, but let's say it doesn't exist, it has to be positive definite. Um, I would argue that uh, no, because it's defined in a region that is unphysical, uh, the Gaussian distribution is, is not appropriate as a choice for prior. Um, However, if you'd like to, uh, to motivate your choice and why you said yes, uh, please stick a uh, reply in the Slack thread on uh, alternative priors. Uh, recall as well that our model's not defined it uh, at identically zero, so we have to avoid that. Um, okay, so now that we've done that, uh, let's move on to uh, prior predictive checks. And so what I'm doing here in block 11 is I am setting a number of draws. I want to take a thousand draws from my prior. Uh, I'm also going to take a sort of a thousand draws from this angular uh, distribution because we know there's some dependence, but it should be flat. Uh, and then I just go ahead and plot those. So if you just uh, evaluate that cell, then what you should see is a plot basically similar to this. Oh, I see a question. We only consider prior range for the priors by saying the moon. So what I do actually is I say there's a 99% likelihood that it's between uh, G moon and G Jupiter. And so I tune a distribution with support uh, from a sort of on the whole real line, uh, a positive real line. Um, but I say 99% of that uh, probability density has to be located between my two values there. So I allow for basically a finite probability of surprise. Okay, so what you should see in this plot and we can interpret is that uh, the distribution of points is dominated by the gravitational acceleration. So the angular displacement um, has an effect, um, but it's, uh, so these are independent. We're not seeing um, that much variation but you can see that by far there's much more variation here uh, in G. Um, so I'll give you an exercise to comment if you like. And what we do is we now draw samples from this prior and calculate the prior predictive distribution which we saw in the slides, uh, which is by running it through the model. So that's block 12. And in block 13, we just go ahead and plot that. So I have some two different samples and you see versus G and versus the angular displacement. You see that there's maybe a weak dependence on period on angular displacement, but much, much stronger dependence of the period on the gravitational acceleration. So um, given, given this, I'm gonna ask for another uh, up down yes, no poll uh, here in Zoom. Um, do you think we're going to be able to get good constraint on the value of G by comparing to the data we generate above, uh, given the range of periods that we, uh, we cover? So uh, please give me a quick green check, red X. Okay, a lot of uh, green checks, so that's, that's looking good. Uh, there is one red X, um, but I'm going to argue that I think we can get probably a pretty decent constraint um, on, on our uh, value of G. Uh, so we should be able to constrain it fairly well because we know it has a very strong dependence on the observable, or the observable is strongly dependent on this parameter. 
So then just as a, another quick plot to, uh, to give you another way of visualizing this, um, I just histogram the results here in period. And you see that sort of distributed roughly evenly again between one and, and five seconds. Um, so that's sort of a, a range that we're really expecting. Um, and I see a sanity check here, um, but that'll be especially relevant if you've gone through and modified things to do these exercises and stop and take these sanity checks. So let me just uh, click back in here. So I, uh, this is just putting it into a data frame. What I'm gonna show you is another data visualization option. Uh, so a package called Seaborn and uh, what this does is it makes it very easy to make sort of these very uh, familiar Bayesian joint distribution plots. And so just going down and evaluating block 16 produces a series of plots that you can sort of go through. And you can see, okay, gee, that's our prior right there. And that's uh, sort of a density estimate of the, of the period. So that looks basically like what we expect. Um, again, look, I'm going to take uh, the period T and compare to theta zero. Um, now I'm putting samples in here rather than that smooth density estimate because we have sharp edges. And so the smooth density estimate isn't going to recover those well. But you see again, not really a, a particularly strong dependence on this parameter. Uh, and then sort of the joint prior here uh, just a visualization of that recovers what we expect. Okay, we've now done steps uh, sort of one and two, and we can move on to uh, model validation via closure tests or fake data simulation or empirical coverage tests. Um, this gets a lot of traction and this gives us further ideas of how much constraint we can expect. Um, so just for fun, uh, I'm going to say that the Earth and Mars are roughly comparable. And we're going to do a closure test with uh, the period of a pendulum on Mars. Maybe someday we'll be able to convince uh, a space agency to stick a simple pendulum up there for us. Um, so this is the same procedure for data, fake data calculation we did before. So you go ahead and evaluate block 17. Just choosing a random, effectively arbitrary set of displacements and running the model at those. Okay, so we then run block 18 and we see this is the validation data. So uh, I hope everybody is sort of following along in your own notebook um, and is getting these exact same results. So you see again is you can see a trend, um, but you know, maybe you can draw a straight line through this, maybe not. So we can see uh, how much constraint we can actually expect. Um, a first check you can do, as I mentioned just here briefly, is you can uh, just take a step back and say, does this data, does, it, does our fake data actually look like the real data? If it doesn't have similar features, that could be a sign that something's going wrong. Um, and so this is a great opportunity to check. And as you can see, there's a sanity check after sanity check built into this method. So you can now go on to the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, I'm gonna spend a decent amount of time here uh, just explaining how this works. Um, we're not going to run it specifically because I've pre-generated some chains, but you are able to run this in your own notebook if you just go to the top and change run MCMC to true. So the first thing is I just put a brief wrapper. So uh, instead of taking one value of theta, we can now have our model take all the different values of angular displacement and return just a list of those calculations. Here's just a brief detail on that likelihood, which we saw in the slides. Again, the slides will be posted after this session. Um, and here is just a, a brief doc string I want to provide for you. Um, if you're not familiar with Python doc strings, it's just basically information on how to use um, functions. Um, but this is for the package that we're using called TEMC. Um, and what it is short for is a parallel tempering uh, MCMC. And what this does, it's a sophisticated algorithm that really explores the space well, and it's really well suited to uh, multimodal distributions. So if you've got two separated regions of parameter space, this really helps explore them well. Uh, this is the actual uh, package that um, 
that we used in the Jetscape Sims working group to produce our results. Uh, and so I just want to provide a little bit of information here of how to use them. Uh, here are what all the parameters are and sort of what order they go in. Um, and here's sort of the, the sampler objects doc string. Uh, we're going to be using them, so you're going to see how to use them in practice. But there's not that much documentation for this package, and so I just want to provide this to you. Um, so if you're turning this around and you want to use this in your own research, um, you have this as a, as a place to start. So um, that is uh, just a little bit about the computational aspect. And then what we're going to do now in block 21 is we're going to define the prior, the log prior specifically, the log likelihood, and the log posterior. So uh, we had a question earlier about discret discretizing the continuous parameters. So we see as we define a function for the log prior that takes in a value of theta. What it then goes down here is you uh, return uh, you know, the, the log of the prior PDF at theta. That, that's all you need to do to uh, define your prior. What we then have is the likelihood function. This is the second function in block 21. And this is a little bit more involved. So what you have to do is you have to pass a parameter array theta, a list of angular displacements, that's our um, sort of the data that we want to calculate this at. X means, that's our data calculation means, and our X errors, so that's our data uncertainty, as well as sort of a, uh, any extra uncertainty we, of time uncertainty we want to incorporate into this model calculation, typically is zero. So we're not, we're not messing with that in this case. What that does is it returns a value for the likelihood. So that's just a little numeric value. So here again, we're just going to enforce if uh, theta is less than zero. So angular displacement is less than zero. It's not well defined. We take a positive initial angular displacement. We run our model calculation. We extract our um, models, model calculations and the model uncertainty. And then this is just sort of a very busy variable. But what this does is it calculates that, uh, that log likelihood that we saw in the slides. Uh, if there's a problem with it, just to catch some errors, we return negative infinity. So it's just uh, log of 0. So no, it's not likely at all. And uh, we can then move on. And then. The log posterior is, uh, remember that the, the posterior is the prior times the likelihood, or uh, it's proportional to that. And so for our log posterior, it's the log prior plus the log likelihood. And as you can see, we're calculating the unnormalized posterior. We'll get into calculating the, the normalization later, but this is, this is how we really do it in practice. Um, so please go ahead and evaluate block 21. And that'll bring us down to block 22. So here are some parameters of the MCMC sampling. Um, I'm just going to give some brief guidance here in the comments. Typically have 10 times the number of dimension of walkers. So every dimension parameter space, you have 10 walkers. It's just typical guidance. Uh, you can do more. It just costs you a little bit more computing time. Uh, you have something called burn in. And so burn in is when I was mentioning the little walkers are uh, uh, sort of walking through the parameter space then they get lost. The number of steps until they get lost is called the burn in. So it's how many steps they have to take before they start sampling from your target. Uh, here I've just put a thousand and then after that we take 5,000 steps. So little walkers are, are confused and walking according to the target for 10,000 steps. Uh, there's an easy way to do parallelization. Uh, I'm doing this on four cores. Uh, again, we're not going to do sampling here, so we don't need to modify it. And then we initialize the walkers within the region of parameter space we think is very, very likely. So 99%. So it's a really wide region, but we just start them off somewhere within that. Uh, then if run MCMC is true, um, you go through each stage, you define your sampler, you define your initial positions, burn in, run your MCMC chains, and then you get uh, something called the acceptance fraction. Um, and what instead we're doing in this example today is just um, loading a, a pre-generated chain. So just go ahead and evaluate block 22. 
Right. Again, if, at any point, please uh, raise your hand if you have a question or having difficulty following along. Uh, I'm hoping to go through this in detail with a working example so you have a baseline to start with. Um, if I find it's much easier to learn things when you have a working example that you can tweak uh, rather than just really having to put things together uh, on the fly. So we've now loaded the chain and we use this package called corner to uh, plot our, our marginal distribution. So this is just the histogram of our, our G. This is a little bit of an underwhelming plot for now. Uh, but if you've seen these big um, Bayesian plots with a lot of parameters that have a, a diagonal component and then off-diagonal joint distributions, you can make those with this package in this exact same way. We're just doing this with a one-parameter example, so it doesn't look quite as impressive, and I'll, I'll make some nicer-looking plots later on. Um, but I just wanted to show you how that works so that when... Uh, if you're doing this in maybe a more uh, intensive example in your own research, you can, um, you can apply this. So as I said, gravity in Mars is 3.72076. That is within our 68% credible region. Uh, just to give you a little bit of vocabulary, in frequentist statistics, people typically say confidence interval in Bayesian says people typically say credible interval or credible region, um, just a little bit of a vocabulary thing. So what this shows us um, from block 23 is that given our model being perfectly suited to the data, we can in fact recover um, the true value. So, uh, and with a good amount of precision, that's plus or minus you know, 0 0.01. So we're getting a relatively precise result out, uh, and we're getting um, what we expected. OK, so now I'm going to go through two uh, MCMC diagnostics just to see um, what those look like. So go ahead and plot block 24. And what you see in block 24 should be, well, exactly this plot, because we're all plotting the same thing. There's 50,000 total steps. Uh, there's uh, each step is plotted, sort of connected by this, by this line. And you have an orange uh, moving average that's, that's flickering throughout this. So this is not the best diagnostic, but it is a really immediate way to see. For example, if this uh, uh, moving average was really changing and not just fluctuating around a value, and say it was going from 3.7 all the way up to uh, 3.74 by the end, then you've not taken enough burn in steps. Another example of something that you might see that suggests you need to alter your MCMC is if your chain is going on for a while and then all of a sudden something changes, say at step 30,000, um, and all of a sudden you have this jump and your moving average shifts. That's another sign that you need to have taken more burn in steps to really explore your parameter space properly. Uh, so there's just some things to look out for. Uh, it's a really clear visual check uh, and you can actually just report this. You can put this plot into a, into a paper and, and demonstrate that your MCMC is behaving well. Uh, I include some, some more details there. Um, and so what we now go on to do is to plot a diagnostic called the autocorrelation. Um, what the autocorrelation does is it quantifies um, basically if your samples are taking a coordinated walk. So that's what you see when it's not burnt in yet. So if your samples are taking a coordinated walk, then they've not converged to your target because when they've converged to your target, they, are, they have walked into your region of interest They've forgotten where they started, and then the steps are um, draws from your posterior. Uh, if you're drawing in a coordinated way, you need to investigate your MCMC behavior a little bit longer because um, your walkers are still walking toward your target. So they have not yet hit the target distribution. So block 25 just uh, defines the function so you can see the, the nitty gritty of how it's calculated. And uh, now in block 26, let's go ahead and plot that autocorrelation. 
I've been going for a little bit of, of time. So uh, just while I describe block 26, please put a Zoom yes, no in if you're following along successfully, just to give me a sense of uh, if I should keep going. Maybe give me a slow down if I'm not going fast enough uh, or going too fast, sorry. Uh, I'm just hoping everyone is understanding and is following along um, and, and sees what's happening. Okay. So what you're seeing here in this autocorrelation plot is that um, there's something called lag. And what that's doing is it's saying, okay, after this many steps, how, how autocorrelated is my chain? And what you see uh, in this plot is that it starts at one because a sample is by construction correlated with itself. Uh, but as soon as you move to two, it drops very close to zero. And then it sort of just fluctuates about zero, uh, a little bit negative, a little bit positive, and doesn't really change after that. That's exactly what you want to see. Uh, if you're seeing a long autocorrelation, say it's, you know, it's 10, 15, 20 steps, or maybe even you're looking at this percentages of your chain, you're 30% of the way through your chain and it's still correlated with your initial value. Again, that's another sign that your MCMC uh, hasn't converged. So that means anything that you calculate with that chain is not a reliable estimate of, of the truth. You need to uh, sort of modify how you're doing your uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, until you get no autocorrelation in a reasonable number of steps so that your uh, chain really is taking true draws from the posterior. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that we've used this um, TEMC package before, but neither of these two diagnostics are uh, specific to a particular uh, MCMC algorithm. You can use this in anything. You can use this in Metropolis Hastings. You can use this in anything uh, you, you write yourself, any other package you find online. Uh, these are diagnostics that are completely general to Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Um, so I encourage you all, uh, if you're taking any, uh, if you're doing any MCMC and you're looking for true and accurate results, check at least these two things. Um, and then make sure you report them to your reader so that they know that your autocorrelation is zero, you are taking true uh, draws, and that your chain and your moving average are stable. Okay. Um, I do mention there's another diagnostic called the Gelman-Rubin diagnostic. Um, this, this is a way to actually uh, identify if you need a longer chain, even if it's converged. It's a great diagnostic. Um, and I give you a sort of a link here where it's calculated to see how that's done. Um, that's in uh, Professor Richard Fernstall's fantastic Bayesian course on his GitHub, all the materials online. Uh, again, if you're really interested in what I'm showing here and what we're going to be seeing in the next few days, please take a look at that. It's, it's really great. Right, so now, we know the tools are working. Uh, let's see what our posterior predictive check looks like. Uh, so just to do the prior uh, predictive check, I'm going to take 5,000 draws from the prior. Um, and then I'm going to take every 10 draws from the posterior. So every 10th value of the chain. Um, you could do every second value. You could do every value. I'm, I'm just saving us a little bit of computing time on the, on the plotting. So that is taking those draws, and it does take like a second or two, at least on my laptop. And then that's block 28. And in block 29, I make some violin plots. Right. So hopefully you have this plot. Uh, I'm going to take a second and just tell you what violin plots are in case you haven't seen them. Uh, a violin plot is basically a generalization of a box and whisker plot. So rather than sort of have lines and blocks at finite intervals or percentiles, what it does, it provides a density estimate of your samples um, throughout the region. And so this is a basically much more visual way of seeing how your underlying samples are distributed. And if you have, say, more complex behavior here, so uh, correlations or multimodal distributions, you can actually see finer behavior in this kind of plot than you could in a uh, box and whisker plot. Uh, there are also other kinds of options. Um, since you have the functions here, you can look up the matplotlib violin plot function, which gives you a whole host of other uh, options. But uh, hopefully, this is a, a good example of how to use them, and you now have 
a working example to use, use on your own as well. Right, so we've got those. What we see is what I, uh, I promised we would see in the talk. Those uh, distributions line up with the uh, fake data. Uh, it's looking good. It's looking like we can produce the uh, features that we expect. And uh, I think we can say that our inference has been successful. Uh, and then just for a little bit more of a, of a prettier uh, histogram than we saw in the corner plot, um, I'm just plotting that same histogram again. Um, what I'm doing here is uh, plotting vertical lines at the 16th, 50th, and 84th, I believe, uh, percentiles, uh, which corresponds to sort of a 68% credible region. Uh, and so you can see that with 68% confidence, the truth is going to be between the left uh, most and the right most. And um, we're actually just dead on the distribution is peaked at the value that we put in. So that is um, exactly the kind of behavior we're looking for. Uh, fantastic. Again, so I include a little bit uh, more details here. So um, again, this can serve as a reference for you to come back to. Uh, I hope these tools are going to be useful to all of you in, in your research. Um, so step four, now that we've gotten to here and you can see we've really gone through some detailed inference, we've gone through these detailed checks, uh, we can finally go ahead and inference with data. And we do this here in block 31. And you can see this looks almost identical to the fake data simulation. This whole setup is the same, uh, which is exactly what we're looking for. We're trying to use the tool in exactly the way we validated it. We validated the model. The only thing that we're changing here in the log L args part of the sampler is what data we're comparing to. So again, this is exactly what we're doing. We've checked that it all works. It's enough samples. It's enough points. Um, our, our overall behavior is good. Uh, the only thing we need to change now is what data we're comparing to. So in that case, please evaluate block 31. Um, in this case, we're just going to load the chain, but again, uh, you can all do this on your local machines. Uh, I think these uh, chains might take order five to 15 minutes to run depending on your, on your processor. And let's run block 32, same corner plot we saw before. And uh, you see, we nearly, we nearly get it. We nearly get 9.80665, which we put in for our fake data generation. Um, but recall as well, this is only within a 68% confidence or uh, with 68% credibility that we're between, you know, nine, we're in 9.82 plus or minus 0 0.01. You can go ahead and change the uh, percentiles uh, of this or the quantiles of this distribution to say get the 90th, uh, 90 uh, percentile credible region. And you can be 90% confidence within two values. So I leave that as well up to you. Um, just for the sake of argument, just because uh, I can, let's say, let's put this from to 0 0.05, 0 0.5, and 0 .0, 0 0.95. Replot that. And you can see with 90% confidence uh, or credibility, we do again achieve that truth value that we put in. So if you can feel free to go ahead and do that in your in your own um, in your own notebook. Okay, so we can see. Okay, 68% credibility. We don't get it. 90% credibility. We do get it. And so that I think is a. It's a decent guide as well as to interpretation on credibility. Um, let me just take a, a moment as well to say, uh, if you're doing sort of these nested credibility intervals and you say you do a 20% uh, credibility region, let's go from 30 or 40 to uh, 60. Okay, you get a really narrow region um, and you get this really finely precise value, but it's not really reflective. You're not getting a very good uh, true confidence. 20% confidence isn't much. So again, 90% confidence. Okay, you're, you're really sure that it's within that. Uh, and in fact, it is. So I hope that's a bit of a hands-on intuitive way to understand that. 
just because we ran it doesn't mean we're free of looking at our diagnostics. Uh, we need to check diagnostics every time. Um, something could happen. And if you didn't check, that is uh, sort of bad practice. So let's uh, plot that MCMC chain again, as we just did before. It takes a little bit uh, because a lot of, a lot of samples. And um, we see again, no coordinated walk, no sudden jumps in the widths of the samples. Again, it's behaving the same way, but if we didn't check, we would have had no way of knowing. So always check. Uh, it's, it, it's very fast. I mean, you see that's 50,000 steps. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Which brings us to block 34, um, which we just do it as a histogram as before. And again, this is just a 68% credible region. So there's our sort of truth value um, because we know how we generated the data. Um, but you can again see this is sort of how this has worked out. Uh, if you were to change this to 90% to a 90% credibility uh, region, you'd again contain that value. Finally, step five, posterior predictive checks with your full inference. Uh, can evaluate, we're taking every 10th value, just like we did before. Again, the only thing we've changed is uh, the data we compared to, and we make another set of violin plots. And this is what I was talking about in the hands-on session. Yeah, these uh, distributions, some of them look real good. Some of them are shifted a little bit from our data. But in general, we see that the posterior predictive distributions have the same features as the data we were comparing to. And maybe this gives us an opportunity to improve our model. Uh, and we can interpret this as saying, OK, maybe there's a, a, a white noise in here that we can tune. Um, maybe we could add that to our model. Uh, maybe you could add a, uh, a model of the measurement error, of exactly how measurement errors are done. And you could sample parameters of, uh, of that that might be sensitive to your observables. Uh, those are examples. Uh, by all means, feel free to play with it. Um, so I'm going to go through a few final things that I think is just really fun and kind of cool. Um, there's some homework on exploring Gaussian processes and a lot of details. I encourage you to do these. These will really help you with your understanding for tomorrow. I'm not going to go through that. Um, but bonus topic one is comparing your posterior and prior. And this is what uh, this is a great way to evaluate the amount of constraint you have. Um, and this is how you get to say, was this prior weekly informative or not? So let's just plot uh, the prior and our posterior again. Uh, that's what happens in block 37 here. And you can see, okay, we've got this really sharp posterior. That's looking great. Um, but I might hear some of you saying, well, that's not really that quantitative. Um, we can see it's really clear, but can I put a number on that? Uh, and there's a concept called statistical distance between two distributions. Um, and I basically give you some formal details of it here. But essentially what you're doing is you're calculating the overlap. Um, and this is a topic uh, that's very often used in information theory. Uh, you might hear about it all the, also called relative entropy of the distributions, for example. It's slightly different. But we're looking at the KL divergence. This is the information gain. And this is what uh, we saw in that Jetscape result I showed in, in the slides. Here is some code to calculate it in block 38. Um, is just calculating uh, basically the overlap of these distributions. You can then calculate that explicitly. And what you find is that going from the prior to the posterior, we gained 3.99 whatever bits of information. And so this is, this is truly an, an information theory quantification of information gained. Um, so we get 3.9 or basically four bits uh, of information. Uh, you can go through and I encourage you to do this. You have all the machinery in front of you to uh, run more steps, change the prior. And you can see uh, if you constrain it much more, you'll gain less information going from the prior to the posterior because your prior was already constrained more. Let's say you constrain your prior less, you'll gain more information um, in the MCMC stage. So it's really an intuitive, uh, just numeric way of doing this. 
Uh, down here, I give a little bit of information on model selection that I talked about uh, in, the, in, the, in the slides. Um, you can only do this if you set run MCMC to true at the top, but here is how you get the log evidence estimate with uncertainty from your MCMC sampler. Uh, so with this, you have basically everything uh, you need to do Bayesian model selection, Bayesian inference. You've got all the tools basically to reproduce any large scale analysis in, uh, with Bayesian tools and heavy ion collisions. Um, right. Uh, with that, I'm going to break for uh, questions. Um, I know I've just been running through this just to show you what you have in front of you um, with a few little questions for yes, no, but hopefully we can take the remaining time in the session today and we can be a little bit more involved and actually go through, change things, run some MCMC, and you can get some experience uh, with things yourselves. Um, so with that, um, I'll take a break for questions. Is anything unclear? Um, do you have anything remaining that you'd like to know about Bayesian inference? Um, really any questions in general before we, we get moving. Okay, seeing none, um, how about we take a five minute break if that's okay with the chairs uh, and we will return at 1140. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set run MCMC to true and we're going to get some hands-on uh, experience actually running things directly in these notebooks. Uh, so let me stop my screen share and um, if we can get a five minute break, um, yeah, if we can put up another uh, side saying 1140 for uh, 11 return.
All right, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, so we've had a question uh, in the uh, Slack as well about if there are any differences between Bayesian and the frequentist approach. Uh, if it's just numerical results are purely methodological. Uh, I'll just sort of give an answer here in the recording as well. So we have it uh, for those listening um, at a later date. And so firstly, it, it's a lot of the differences in the interpretation. Um, as I've mentioned before, I think it, the Bayesian interpretation is basically what scientists typically do when, you, when they interpret plots. Um, there are some cases where there are numerical differences actually as well. Um, it's a variety of classic examples in all the textbooks I think I've linked. Uh, they usually start off with uh, a difference between the two methods as an example, uh, but I've given a quick uh, link to some more examples as well. But um, there's one famous example, I think by Jaynes, uh, who shows that you know with all, all the tools at, at the disposal, both frequentist and Bayesian statistics, um, the true answer is not within a frequentist confidence interval. Um, but this can get a little bit hairy. And I think in general, it's relatively fair to say that they yield, broadly speaking, um, very similar results that should be interpreted differently. Uh, and that the Bayesian result often comes by much more intuitive uh, mathematics. So I hope that helps. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Um, we're going to change some of those flags at the top. I was just looking at that uh, Stack Exchange reference I put in the chat. Um, can't really close that because of the Zoom thing. Fantastic. Um, so let's return to the top of the notebook in block one. Uh, if all of you are following along. And we don't need to generate data, but what we should do is change run MCMC to true. So now in our, in our brief uh, remaining hands-on time, we're actually going to run the MCMC ourselves and uh, see what happens. Now, just because we already talked about changing the priors, uh, what I'm going to suggest is we scroll down here to, um, all the way down to, block eight, and let's define a new prior. Uh, you can motivate this however you want. Uh, I put in the scipy.stats reference, where is it? Uh, down here in the exercises. And so you can open that scipy.stats reference. Uh, I'll put the link in Slack. And you can replace, say, inv gamma by any of the other distributions that you motivate, and uh, then go ahead and retune it, say, between a lower limit and an upper limit for 99% of your uh, prior. Uh, so if you go ahead, um, let me know what you choose. Um, you can put your motivation again in Slack. Um, I'm going to say now change this so that this is a much narrower interval so we can see what that does to the inference. And if this uh, changes how much bias we get or the information we get. So I'm gonna change this from going to be five to uh, 14. But uh, please put in Slack what you change. Um, maybe you only put a much lower amount of the uh, interval in, uh, but please send a green check or a red X if you uh, are successful with modifying the prior information um, or if you're having difficulty. I'll wait a few minutes for that. Um, and I'm very curious to hear uh, how you've chosen to change it.
So we got one green check. Uh, anyone else is changing and has been successful, let me know. Uh, if you're just sort of following along and change it the way uh, I just changed the, the distribution uh, there, let me know. Uh, if you need more time, please put in go slower. Um, I'm happy to, to, to take as much time as anyone wants. Okay, we've got a few more. Um, and so what we can then do is evaluate all the cells below that. We plot the prior CDF and PDF. Uh, and you can see now that we sort of shifted things a little bit down this way. Um, to redefine that prior G. Looks broadly similar, but it's much more constrained. And then we can take Draws. And when we do this again, we have to go through all of these stages. But since we know the pieces already work, we can sort of go through uh, relatively quickly. And then I want us to at least have the opportunity to run some MCMC -MC chains uh, locally on, on your machine before we go. So please evaluate then through to block 22. And I'm just going to pause again, uh, just so I know everyone's here with me. And please give me a green check if you're following along, a red X if uh, you're not. And what we're going to do is we're going to just change the number of steps we take and then run the MCMC and uh, see how, how this works. So if you please give me a, a green check to let me know if you've sort of evaluated all those cells now and are ready to, to do the MCMC. Ah, we got a question. Why don't we have to check the prior again after changing it? Um, you do. Um, so in theory, uh, you can do that by going through here. And we did the uh, prior draws. That's what we're, you do when you sort of evaluate all those cells in between. Uh, I'm skipping over it just uh, quickly, just because we're getting close to the, um, the end of the session. But you do, in fact, have to check the prior again and evaluating the cells up to the MCMC produced all the plots you need to do that. So I hope, I hope that's clear. Okay, so again, uh, green checks for coming along to uh, block 22 once we've uh, evaluated those intermediary cells. Okay, another a decent number of green checks coming through. Um, because we have about nine minutes left, uh, I'm going to suggest let's reduce the number of burn-in steps from 1,000 to 250. Or actually, let's put this down to 10, and you can see uh, an MC, MC that has not converged. Uh, even put it at five, five burn-in steps. Um, I think it's important to see an example of how to identify something not working. Uh, and then for number of iterations, again, just, just for the interest of time, let's cut that down to 500. So you have five, so n burn-in is five, n iterations is 500. 
uh, we won't thin the chain. And uh, on my laptop, four threads is fine. Uh, if your laptop doesn't have that many, please reduce that number. Uh, it'll just take a little bit longer to run. But let's now uh, sort of evaluate this cell. And see that's running. Um, did I not evaluate the run MCMC? So we, I did not. Run MCMC. Sorry about that. Uh, should now evaluate that cell with our updated parameters. And you get a few runtime warnings. That's totally normal. And sort of just bumping against the edge of our um, sort of sharp cutoff there. And you see this is running. And if I pull up uh, system monitor on Linux, you can see my uh, CPUs. And in this top panel here, you can see that there, we are in fact successfully using multiple cores to do this uh, MCMC sampling. So let me just ask for feedback again. Uh, if the sampling is working for you, please give me a green check. Uh, if you're having difficulty, uh, please let us know. Okay, mine has finished the sampling. So I'm going to look at the Plot of the posterior. Oh, and it's decided to stop uh, giving me my outputs. Um, that's upsetting. Um, let me just add a save fig. Uh, let's evaluate. The trace. Apparently, I am going to need to uh, open this here and let's look for closure trace.png. Okay, actually, even at a relatively few number of steps, it's doing pretty well. Um, but you do see that there are some, some spikes coming up here. And so, some maybe a little bit strange behavior because we haven't done that many steps for the burn in. And so, in here, you're going to get a coordinated walk from 3.68 down into this region of interest. So as I said, it hasn't really, uh, hasn't really converged yet. Um, let's go down and look at the autocorrelation. Mine is apparently going to not want to show in the Jupyter notebook window, uh, but let me uh, quickly go in here and just open the autocorrelation figure manually. And okay, you see that there's a little bit longer of a step down here uh, because we're having coordinated walks. Um, it just so happens this is a relatively straightforward model, so it, it's converging quickly. But you might have a very large parameter space and a poorly defined prior and whatever else that causes a, uh, a faster uh, drop. Ooh, let me zoom back in here. Um, we can. Oh, no. OK. We can, again, make all of those plots. Um, I encourage you to do so. Mine are apparently not showing in, in line. Um, and so I'm just going to evaluate the cells and, and, and move on. Um, so we've just done the closure. You go through. We can interpret again, uh, very likely because I've um, only uh, tightened my prior. We're not going to see much difference in the result. Uh, oops. Let me uh, stop that. So let's again change the number of burn ins and the number of iterations. Um, 
for the production inference, run that, should take a few minutes. Again, we're now able to do this with our new prior. So when you have this run MCMC, uh, I encourage you to go through, play with this, uh, play with the number of burn-ins, the number of iterations, um, compare it to the original chains that we had. Um, and now because you're running the actual sampler itself, you're going to be able to do the calculation of the uh, Bayes evidence in the, at the end of the slide. Um, so you can then use that to do model selection and you can see how it might look like the autocorrelation is fine, but if our chain hasn't explored the space, we're going to get a large uncertainty on the Bayes evidence. So this is all sorts of things you can play around with, and I hope the exercises guide you to do that. Um, I'm just going to sign off now with a few minutes left uh, with this section on homework, exploring Gaussian processes. Um, there is some coding you can do here. Everything is still self-contained in the Docker container. Um, so you can generate a Latin hypercube in however many dimensions. I'd encourage you to do this before tomorrow to get an idea of how this is uh, how this works. Um, but I also provide some demos. Uh, so please uh, sort of explore Gaussian processes in demos like this one. Oops, that's not working. Um, so maybe in this article. Uh, there's various vi uh, visual explorations of Gaussian processes. Uh, you can say add points here and sort of get a feel of how training data constrains uh, your result. And I hope this is a sort of intuitive building block uh, towards tomorrow's session. Um, there's a number of exercises as well. And uh, as a homework uh, project, if you uh, are really interested, this is a great place to um, get your hands wet, uh, you could incorporate a Gaussian process into this and get a feel of how those work in this simple example as well. Um, I thank everyone for your continuing attention. Uh, thank you for staying with me and going through the notebook and the talk. I hope you've learned something today about Bayesian inference and workflow, and um, I hope you enjoy the, re the rest of the school. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I hope these tools are useful to you in your research and that um, you can turn around and apply these in a meaningful way.